Handouts today, those are just the questions that you've already had. Sometimes it's nice to have them right in front of you. today. If you'll please pick those up on your way in. These are questions you've already seen, the tenant questions. It's nice to have them in front of you so you don't have to use your computer. Did you? Yeah, we got a hold. Oh, we, um, when my business class, we, like, went all the way up. You can see, like, where each of us, like, where it cut out. Yeah. Each of us, and, like, some of the really high pitch, like, the high frequencies, like, how far do you go up? Do you remember?
You want to find out? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm happy to do that. Coming in, we have a couple of handouts on the front table. Please make sure you have one of each. Nothing new there. They're just the 10 ed questions that you've already responded to. A couple of handouts on the front table. Okay, our computer clock says 12.30, so why don't we get started? Good afternoon, S&P. Good afternoon. All right, that's our orienting response. Welcome to Wednesday. I've got some really great news. One week from today, we're going to have an exam. Let's give it up for the exam. Yeah? yeah? All right, all right. So this is going to be the fourth exam that we've had during the semester. And you've seen this slide many, many times before. I'll just resize that. Sometimes we hit the auto image, it comes back. Same kind of a, a layout. These are low stakes tests. We have lots of little exams along the way so that no one of them weighs all that much. You've had these kinds of generative responses before. You know that they're going to be mostly uh, short answer questions. You probably have to draw some graphs. You spend a lot of time drawing graphs in draw time, so nothing new there. And as always, there's some accumulation of knowledge here in this class. So they are somewhat cumulative, but the emphasis will be on the material since the last exam. The last exam was October 28th. Okay? So if you look over uh, the materials since then, you'll be in, in very good shape. I'll give you a couple of other reminders, but I always like to give you a reminder one week out. Okay? Okay, another announcement that we have is that for Friday's class, it will be a TED Ed as usual. We'll have a, a TED Ed um, uh, ready for you to go, and in fact, it's, it's waiting for you. There is one minor change, though. The minor change is that we were going to be talking about a paper that was co-authored by Ray Stanley and I. Ray Stanley is a 2003 graduate of Denison, and when I was coming to Denison in 2001, I was walking up these stairs in the east uh, east part of this hallway, and the very first student that I met was Ray Stanley. He happened to be doing summer research with Dr. Dow, who was just been here a few moments ago, and he, he greeted me and said, I've got you for S&P in a couple of weeks, and it was really great to meet Ray. I didn't realize at the time that he would go on to do research in my lab, and he and I published a paper together. So we've actually um, uh, done this paper in class a couple of times before. The last time we did it, in 2013, we had Ray Skype in, which is really fun, and we have a video of that. So we were going to do that for the TED Ed, except I was going to have Ray Skype in this time, but earlier this semester, I'm very sad to say, and I say this only with his permission, he had a stroke. Uh, at a very young age, 34, 35, yeah, Ray, yeah, so he's, he's made it through. Um, he's, he's recovering, 
but he does have a stroke. He's not going to be able to join us by Skype. Um, so we could do his article, but there are a couple of other things I thought we might do instead. We'll still have a TED-Ed on schedule, but we'll, um, we'll try to take advantage of that moment to review a bit. We're going to review for, um, in part, the upcoming exam, but also maybe review more generally for the final exam. So the questions that you will see in the TED-Ed will ask you for you to generate your own questions about signal detection theory or psycho psychometric functions or color perception or sound localization or whatever the case might be. And there are also a couple of other questions that I think you might really, really enjoy. These are questions based on a video by Heather Artinian. Does anybody know Heather Artinian? Does anybody know the video Sound and Fury? Okay. For those of us who do know Sound and Fury, what can you tell us about the video Sound and Fury? Not remembering? No? Okay. So the video Sound and Fury is a video that came out in 2000. It's about the issue of cochlear implants. So we're going to have a whole uh, session dedicated to that on cochlear implants. How many people are familiar with that? I, th I think I had asked before, most of us are familiar with the idea that some children will have a surgery in order to implant a cochlear a uh, cochlear device that will allow them to hear. So the story revolves around then young uh, Heather Artinian, who was five when we first tuned in. Then there was Heather, there was Sound and Fury six years later. We come to her in late middle school, something like that. Now she's basically your age, maybe even a year older or so than you. She's a student at Georgetown, and she's talking to us about her experiences with cochlear implants. So we have a couple of questions in the TED Ed about that, and then the rest of the questions will be review of the set of stuff for the exam and the final exam. Okay, so TED Ed on schedule, but a different topic, right? Who's okay with all of that? All right, all right, very good. Okay, so we were plugging away last time on the blind watchmaker, okay? And we made some really good progress through this, but we had a couple of other uh, items to finish. So what I thought we'd do is take one of the questions as the big group, and then we'll give you a chance to break up into smaller groups just for a moment or two and talk through some of your logical fallacies. Those are going to be really, really interesting, okay? So um, let's dial down to where we were last time. We made it through, I think, question nine. Okay, we had gotten that far. We talked about B.F. Skinner's aversion to talking about things that couldn't be directly measured. Okay? And this was about the notion of the internal representation that that might build up as they're moving about in this sea of echoes. Okay? So then we had this other question that came from the chapter, and it's that polar bears are very large, high-reflectance animals. High-reflectance means they look white. Okay? That's one of the ways of thinking about that. Do the animals on which they feed easily see them? Okay, so can somebody help us out with that? And also maybe the Nicholson contrast formula. Go ahead, Megan. Um, well, I said that the animals that they hunt don't easily see them, because even if they are kind of like animals, their um, environment is similarly high-reflectant, so they kind of, it almost camouflages them. Okay, okay, right. And who remembers hearing about the Nicholson contrast formula? Anybody want to, if you do remember what that was, if you can spell it out for us, the Mickelson contrast form. It's been a little while since we've talked about Mickelson, but it's speaking to the point that that Meg's got it. Maybe Claire's got it here. That's right. Okay, so we're looking for any particular stimulus you might see. We're going to ask what is the maximum min luminance, what is the minimum luminance. We'll find the difference. That goes in our numerator, and then our denominator is the sum. So it's the difference over the sum. And if you're a white bear, you're going to be high reflectance. Okay, but if your background is also white there's going to be either no difference or maybe uh, a very small difference between the max, uh, the luminance maximum and the luminance minimum. So you're going to have almost no contrast there. Okay? Let's harken back to one other example. When we were talking early in the semester about different theories and different theorists in, in visual perception, we talked about J.J. Gibson. And he had this wonderful analogy about being in a sauna and trying to see in a sauna where there's a lot of um, a lot of steam around, and really, really thick steam in the sauna. And we had the example about turning the lights up and down in the sauna. Who remembers that particular? Can anybody complete that for us? What was his point about, about being in that sauna? And I realize it's been a long time. It's kind of like being in an all-white environment. Does anybody recall? It helped us to understand. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you could tell the light, uh, like Okay, right. So you can tell that the overall light level is up or the overall level is down, but you don't have any real information about where to step, 
where to reach. Okay, there's no difference in light levels. And when you don't have a difference, we don't have any contrast, we don't have any information. And we've defined information a few times as a reduction of uncertainty. Right? Okay? So, and that's where our ganglion cells come in. The ganglion cells are telling us about what's light and what's dark. Okay, the photoreceptors catch the light, but they don't tell us about where the light dark boundaries are. And that's important for where we're stepping, where we're reaching, as we're writing down on our page. We need to be able to see boundaries. Okay, so all of that comes about because of this question of camouflage and being able to see differences, not just pick up light, but be able to see differences to get that information, the reduction of uncertainty. Okay. Okay, we can go a couple of ways with this. I think what I'll do is get you early into groups. We'll have you spend just a moment or two. We'll ask everybody to address this question, question number 11, on incredulity. Right? It's one of the logical fallacies. Right? The, the argument from personal incredulity is one fallacy. So we'll ask you to discuss that in a group. And then we'll ask the people who are, why don't we do it this way? Uh, the groups are over here. Okay? Can you also do the fallacy that is in question 12? Okay? And that's going to be the fallacy on ignorance. Okay? And then for the folks in the center, in addition to doing the fallacy of incredulity, could you also do the, the, the argument from ignorance? A really interesting one. Okay. And then we have uh, the folks over here. Can we have you do the ad populum argument? And I think, I, I don't know if I gave you over here, which you've got the incredulity, but you also have ad hominem. That, can we give you ad hominem now? Is that all right? So ad hominem and incredulity. These folks have ad populum over on this side and these folks have ignorance. Yeah? Okay, so find a partner, uh, and if you have to be in a three-person group, that's okay. We'll give you just a couple of minutes and talk through those fallacies. We'll leave the 15th item for a little bit later. Yeah, you've got 11 and 14 over here. Yeah. Yeah. For one more minute, you can finish your thought there. I realize not everybody's on their second fallacy, but.
Okay, in the interest of time, why don't we move on? We'll see if we can come back together as a group, and we'll see how many fallacies we can we can articulate and uh, get some examples of these, perhaps. So we'll dial back to the first one in the sequence of several fallacies, and this was the one that actually occurred in the book. And uh, every year I've done this one, and this year is the first time that I'm adding these other fallacies because I think it's an important topic and we do want to have you refine your critical reasoning on any topic that we might have. So this first one reared its head in the book. It was personal incredulity. And can somebody help us out with that? And maybe even uh, how it occurred in the book. But we'll just start out with the general idea first. Personal incredulity? Okay, we'll go with Gabby. So the cultural fallacy is kind of like someone says the evidence is too difficult to understand Okay. Okay. So the book, I think um, the guy was saying that um, bats are like humans just came up to echolocation and so on radar and so like how the bats have done that, but so complicated so we didn't really know. Okay. Excellent. That, yeah, that was exactly the, the context in which it was raised in our chapter. That the, this idea that um, we, we had these engineers in World War II who were dealing with sonar and radar in order to protect themselves and advance against the enemy, and they thought this was all very sophisticated, and they didn't want to believe that a simple, humble bat had actually perfected this and was doing it at a much greater level of precision than we were doing. They found that difficult to believe, just given their context, and because they thought it was difficult to believe, they thought it was probably not true. So bats can do echolocation and that they do it well um, was something that they believed to be unlikely, simply because it appeared to them to be complicated. They couldn't themselves understand how the bats could do it, therefore they concluded the bats couldn't be doing it. Right? So that, that is a fallacy, right? it's, uh, and, and we probably see that uh, at various times. Did anybody generate their own example of an argument of personal incredulity? Maybe you've seen these from various times in your, in your life. No, it's okay if you didn't. I, I thought you might uh, you might have one handy. We'll probably come to you. And uh, during one of our student-generated discussions, you might find out that uh, somebody is advancing an argument from personal incredulity. Okay, in the interest of time, why don't we go on and just get a feel for some other kinds of fallacies. Can somebody help us out with the argument from ignorance? Okay, thank you, Jess. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, very, very nicely done. Very nicely done. Um, so th this rears its head pretty frequently in all kinds of conversations. I, I will share with you the, the favorite story that I have on this. When I was an undergraduate, and I was taking a course, interestingly, in logic. It was offered by our philosophy department at the time. And there were all kinds of propositional logic exercises that you had to do in truth tables. Then we had, I think, a whole week on fallacies. And there are fallacies of ambiguity. There are fallacies of relevance. One of several fallacies of relevance is this argument from ignorance. And this is my favorite story on this one. And I don't know if the details are exactly right, but I think you'll get the gist of it. It deals with a historical fact. And this is going on centuries ago when Galileo was developing a telescope and looking around and seeing all kinds of things. And he was among the first, at least in his area, to identify that the moon had craters. Okay? And that seemed rather surprising. He would look up uh, at, the, at the moon and see the craters. And he'd give the, the telescope to other people and they could verify, too, that the moon had craters. 
Now, um, this was a problem. Why was this a problem? There were some people in his time and in his location that believed that the moon was perfectly flat, and some of them claimed that they had a scriptural reason for believing that the moon was flat and just a uh, perfectly flat surface. It looks that way to the naked eye. You would, you, it might look discolored, but you wouldn't know that those are concavities and convexities. So they believed there was a scriptural basis for this thing to be flat. So they looked through the telescope and they see, wow, there does appear to be craters. So their first move was, you know, there's something funny about Galileo's telescope. He's trying to play a trick on us. Um, uh, he's, he's probably jimmied that thing. But then they looked at other objects and noticed that other objects were looking basically the way they are, just larger. So that objection didn't work. So then they came up with this objection. It's an argument from ignorance. They came up with the objection that, you know what? It probably is true that the moon appears to have craters, but the moon might be covered with invisible moon dust that levels out the surface of the moon. So it looks like there's a crater there, but if you were to walk across it, you wouldn't fall into the crater because there's invisible moon dust there. Right? Okay. Now, it could be that there's invisible moon. We actually can't disprove the existence of invisible moon dust. Right? So, and because we can't disprove it, some of the folks who wanted to retain their scriptural interpretation of a very flat surface moon would tell Galileo that, in fact, uh, you know, it looks like there's craters, yeah, but they're really not there because of the invisible moon. <coughs> Who's following why that's an, an example of an argument from ignorance, right? You can't disprove that, okay? So Galileo being the wise guy that is, what, what was his response? Does anybody know? A real wise guy, I'm saying. He, he probably didn't say, well, that's, a, that's the argument ignorantum, right, which would have been the Latin for this. He didn't say that. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. There's, there's lots of invisible moon dust on the moon, and momentarily it flattens out the moon, but then there's even more moon dust, and that creates a crater. Around, <laughs> around that. And then somebody comes by and says, well, maybe we put more moon dust on top of that crater. And then said, but on top of that, there's another crater. And then so we have these, you know, layer after layer after layer of ignorance, right? It could be true that there is layer after layer of moon dust, but what we can see empirically is that there appears to be craters going on there. Okay? And maybe this is the kind of thing that inspires people like Skinner and others to say, you know, we would do ourselves a favor if we stay relatively close to the data. Because when you start speculating, all kinds of things happen. <laughs> okay? All right, so that's our little anecdote about the argument from ignorance. A logical fallacy, one of several, um, but just one of several. Let's go on to number 13. We have a different subset of you working on number 13. And this is called the ad populum argument. Somebody help us out with this, this fallacy. Ad populum. Thank you, Zach. The fallacy is like, um, if a lot of people believe something, it must be true. Yeah, okay. So like, if everyone thinks speeding is fine on the highway, then it must be true. Right, okay, right. So, yeah, the, the truth of a proposition, the truth of a claim, is actually independent of its popularity, right? So, it might be true, actually, that something is popular, but that doesn't make the, the belief itself necessarily factually correct or factually incorrect. It doesn't make it desirable or undesirable. Um, so, there is that argument ad populum, and that, that rears its head pretty frequently, too. Okay, let's go on and do one more that we've identified, and here's the ad hominem argument, okay? Uh, literally translating to at the man is how that would translate. Okay? And that's um, somewhat one-sided on gender, but that's, these things come to us from way, way back. So at the person, you can think of it that way, ad hominem. Thank you, Alexa. So this is a more personal attack than the person making the argument. Okay. The argument. Okay, right, so it's a personal attack. So we're almost criticizing the actor rather than the action would be one way of thinking about that, okay? Interestingly, the ad hominem argument comes in two flavors, at least. There's the ad hominem abusive. You know, you might say something like, um, my opponent is wrong because my opponent is a scoundrel. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're, you're attacking that person's integrity and, and something along these lines. You might instead say that my opponent is wrong because my opponent is conflicted my opponent has a financial conflict of interest in this particular case. So what you're pointing to is not necessarily an intrinsic property of the person's character. You're just saying that in this situation, there is something that is making this particular actor inappropriate or implausible or undesirable for some other reason. It's still sort of directed at the person, but it's almost at the person's situation, right, rather than at the person's character. So a couple of variations there. I saw a couple of really great examples of this on your TED-Ed responses. Okay. Anybody um, want to share? A, a, some people had really recent, in the news, kind of ad hominem attacks. Anybody want to share theirs, if you remember it? There's a couple of really good ones, really good examples. Please. No? Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, there was one that Clinton used 
in the last debate, and I'm not going to be able to do this because basically Sanders made a comment that everybody should stop yelling about guns. Okay. Um, Clinton, Clinton used that as a, a um, uh, you are telling me to stop yelling about guns. Uh, I'm a woman, therefore you are telling women to stop yelling about guns. You are a misogynist. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Supporter of, um, I think she uses, you are an NRA, uh, uh, a supporter of the NRA and a misogynist. Okay. Uh, so okay, and so in that context, to have said a supporter of the NRA might have been a bit of a an ad hominem attack. So NRA doesn't have to be problematic, but in certain political circles, NRA is good. In other political circles, NRA is bad. So if we can now somehow link the opponent to some circumstance, we can make an ad hominem. So it's not really about the validity of the gun argument, right? It's about where how you're how you're situated relative to some group that might be desirable or less desirable. Okay? Um, Something else. We had there was one I remember about Ben Carson and Yale. Anybody? I, I actually don't remember who had that. Okay, thanks. So I said uh, Ben Carson lied about the scholarship to Yale's opponent. Therefore, people would say that like, his stance is anti-supportive, that his stance on health care is okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So so now that might be something more of a of an ad hominem abusive, right? So because he lied, we're almost going after the character here. And then his position on other, on other topics cannot be trusted. Okay? So we've come a long way now from psychophysics, but we were, we were into this because we were trying to understand the argument from personal incredulity and the fact that uh, the engineers were not believing that bats could do the sonar trick. Uh, other folks will not believe that the eye could, could evolve through something as simple as random mutation and non-random selection. It's a very simple process, but some people won't buy that it can accumulate to the biological complexity that we, we observe. Okay, I, we could spend a moment on this. I would like to uh, keep us moving. There, this last one was uh, kind of like a, a catch-all fallacy. There was a wiki page that had a whole bunch of fallacies of relevance. These included the argument from ignorance, the argument ad populum, um, ad hominem arguments and so forth. Incredulity might have been on there. There are probably others on there, uh, but there are so many that uh, it's hard to know how to how to take, dive into that in just a limited amount of time. Did anybody find something that they wanted to, to share? Liz has something. Okay. Um, so I picked the genetic fallacy, which is basically assuming a person should have certain traits because like, they have certain genetics. Okay. Um, and then I picked the ad hominem fallacy because they're from a certain area of the world. The example I used was a quote from Negro that said, "If you're from Africa, then why are you white?" Ah, okay, all right, yeah. So there's something uh, there's genetic fallacy there. There's also something in the category of fallacy, right? Okay, and uh, stereotyping. Okay, okay. Something else. Did somebody else have another one? Oh, I had one. Okay. Um, nature fallacy. The so nature fallacy. To say that something, if it's unnatural, is incorrect. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So, mm -hmm. I forget. My example was just taking a stats exam is just unnatural. Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, taking a stats exam is unnatural. Okay, yeah. Or, or uh, you know, uh, I was going to change my diet to be this or my diet to be that, but you know, that diet is unnatural. It, it would be claims, all kinds of claims about what is natural in the world of dietary debate. Right? Uh, okay. Okay, really good. So I think you get a flavor for those. All right, so that's our blind watchmaker discussion. Thank you for your responses. Some uh, ending questions or uh, issues of unclarity that I can help you with. Anything that is not clear to you about the blind watchmaker chapter? Okay, I think we're, we're doing okay. So then today, we we're back to sound localization, and we we're getting into some of the details of sound localization, and we have uh, the TED-Ed questions before you. Again, I have them listed here. Why don't we do one other small group exercise? And this time, because some of the questions are really fast, I'm sure you can go through them quickly. Why don't we give you about five minutes to do some small group work, and we'll have, um, why don't we have something like uh, this side. Can you do questions, um, how about nine through 15? This side, can you do questions one through eight? And in the center, how about in the back, can you do 1 through 8, and in the front here, can you do 9 through 15, okay? Because right? some of them go pretty quickly. All right, so we'll let you mix with your partner. We'll give you about five minutes to talk those over, and then we'll make our way on through. Yeah, I just, 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 I just
about another minute or so to let you finish up as far as you can get.
Okay, I realize we're not all done, and maybe we didn't make it all the way through, but we probably got a pretty good start on them. And it would be a good idea to come back together and see where we all are. So one of the, actually the first question that we had on sound localization, of course this very much is germane to what we just finished talking about in, in good design. That was all about how do you, how do you, how does evolution build an animal as, uh, with, with the same kind of property that the bat would have that could localize sounds very, very precisely. So now we're looking at some of the cues that might be available and so forth. So we'll start out with question one. What physical aspect of sound, if any, provides intrinsic information about location? Also, what does the answer to that question suggest about how we localize sound? So Madison's got an enthusiastic response. Um, <laughs> is, is there physical There's no physical property, okay? Localization suggests that the localization of sound happens in neural events Okay, right. So this is kind of interesting because when we started out the last conversation, we had a couple of graphs that were linking us back to something we learned earlier in the semester about color vision. We had figured out that it might be the case that uh, that bats actually hear hue. You and I see hue. We don't hear hue, but maybe bats see hue, and we can look at the physical properties. We can look at wavelength. We can look at saturation. We can look at brightness and so forth, and we can see what the physical correlates are. Now we're going to a different feature. We're not talking about the subjective quality of pitch, but where is this thing located? And actually, there's nothing in the stimulus per se that tells us that. So as Madison's pointing out, we do have to somehow generate all that inside of the head. Okay? Pretty interesting that this is coming about just through neural properties. It's not out there in the stimulus. That will, that will come back to us one more time toward the end of this, this conversation. Let's go on to question two. In your own words, succinctly explain the concepts of azimuth and elevation. Also, what units are the, these, these measured? Why don't we just all point to those? Can we all point to where azimuth is? We all did this on the video. Look at the group go. All right. Okay. Everybody's got the, the motion. I'm keeping my hands behind the back. Show me elevation. Okay. And so you could use any number of units. What might the unit of measure be for these? I see it on the... Go ahead, Lizzie. Are the azimuth measured as degrees? Degrees, right. And you can do the same. You can almost grab that azimuth. It's looking like this. And just spin it this way and talk about go up 90 degrees or go down 90 degrees. So we're typically using some kind of angular unit of measure. Often it's degrees. It could be a, an alternative radians for those of you who took some geometry. But some kind of angular unit of measure is what we're going to be expressing this in. Okay? All right, so we're off to question three. In your own words, summarize the evolutionary point the video makes about terrestrial animals and localization. Somebody help me. Okay, we'll go with, we'll go with Jess this time. Um, Okay, right, yeah, you know, really, really interesting that um, we were pretty much limited to just this one plane, right? So we need to localize things going on here in this, this one plane. We're not good at picking up sounds that are coming from different kinds of elevations. Other animals are going to be really good at that. Birds who have to navigate uh, that kind of environment and fish who have to really move through three dimensions as birds do are going to be really good at that. But for most of us under most situations, we're going to be just moving on uh, across the ground. So our, uh, our ability to localize in the azimuth is going to be primary for us. Okay? The next three questions form a trio. They're going to be talking about a particular kind of cue that we use, and then the three questions after that form a different trio that are uh, going to be related to uh, interall time differences. But first, we have the IID. Okay, and can we have somebody explain what that is in their own words, just to get that topic going? What is an IID? Okay, Liz, thank you. Um, this is the Okay, all right, so that difference in, in energy between the two ears, when in fact there is a difference, there isn't one. And we can record those, the video we mentioned having really small microphones, you can place them inside of the ears, okay, and uh, you can record dB levels either in sound pressure level, which would be dB SPL, or intensity level. It's a little check, does anybody remember the relationship between pressure and intensity on the first day of this conversation? We said that we do, we do the physical properties first. What was the physical relationship between pressure and intensity? Go ahead, Nick. 
that p squared is equal to i. <laughs> That's okay. P squared is equal to i, okay? So if we square the pressure, we wind up with the intensity. And when you're looking at literature in auditory psychology, maybe speech pathology and so forth, and you'll, you'll see some references to speech pathology, by the way, uh, on Monday when we're having that conversation proper, and also on Friday when you're hearing about um, Heather Artinian talking about her her work with cochlear implants and so forth, and her speech pathologist, uh, they'll, they'll be mentioning all, all kinds of physical phenomena, including DBSPL and DBIL, intensity level. Okay. All right, so we'll keep moving here. And then we'll ask, well, we had some people draw different kinds of uh, graphs. Why don't I just um, take a look at a few of them? Even one of them might do the trick. So this was you and draw two, and we're up to question number five, okay? And we're asking you to draw on one graph the IIDs um, that might be observed from the range of 0 to 180 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at what this person has to say. Okay, that's looking actually quite good. Um, you can see that we're taking our direction of sound from, uh, we'll say 0 is straight ahead, we'll say 180 degrees is behind us. That's somewhat arbitrary, but that's the, that's the uh, arrangement that we used in the video. And here we have the interval <coughs> intensity difference, right, the IID expressed in decibels. Okay. And you can see that we have this nice quadratic function. Okay, so it's, there's a, there is a pattern there. It isn't a linear pattern. It's a quadratic pattern. Okay, at least for the 6,000 hertz tone, right, is is what we see going on there. For the 200 hertz tone, we have uh, no such IID, and that's that's kind of interesting also. Um, and so I wonder if somebody can elaborate on that pattern. This is question number six. Why do we have those those different patterns? For 200, we're not getting any kind of a any kind of a change in our IIDs, but we are getting them for 6,000. Somebody help us out with that. Okay, thanks. Better frequency. There's a smaller wavelength, and uh, so like when it hits one year and wraps the next, uh, it decreases in intensity, but at a lower wavelength, or at a lower Excellent. Okay. All right. So the, the key here is to understand that we might get IIDs or not in a way that depends entirely on frequency. And the, the key there is to remember that frequency is somehow relatable to wavelength. We have shorter wavelengths. We have longer wavelengths. Remember that we said in a couple of times, but certainly our opening discussion on hearing, we talked about the inverse relationship between those. Um, just to make sure that we don't completely lose that, we'll go back to something that we tried the, the other day when we were talking about this inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. Let me go to Excel if I can find it. And we'll see if you can harken back to the computation that you made. We talked about playing maybe the A above middle C. Okay, and anybody remember how many cycles per second that was, A above middle C? 440, okay, 440 hertz. So 440 um, compressions and rarefactions per second is what's going on for the A above middle C, okay? And then we also said we could figure out, interestingly, how long the, the wave is. If we're playing the A above middle C, how long is that wave? Okay, and we can express it. And the way that we did that was we had to somehow relate it to the speed of sound in a given medium. So let's, let's see if we can remind ourselves about how that computation might go. And then we'll bring this all back to this quadratic pattern that we're seeing for the 6,000 hertz tone versus the flat pattern that we're seeing for the 200 hertz tone. So this will be the speed of sound. Can you remind me what the speed of sound was in air? Anybody recall what that number was? Yell out if you remember. There it is. 343 meters per second. Okay. And I'll just get a couple of these going here. So 343 meters per second is our speed of sound. Okay. And let's say we have a particular frequency. Uh, maybe we want to do the A above middle C. And we said that was 440. Okay. And we can also call up, I think somewhere over here, we have our online tone generator. Here's 440. And we'll put it on sine wave. So we're hearing what we might call as a moderate pitch. If you're a tenor, this would be sort of your target note. If you can reach the A above middle C as a tenor, you're doing pretty well. A lot of tenors can't quite get there, okay? That's what the, the tenors are shooting for, okay? And so we've got that frequency. They're trying to hit that one. And we're going to try to figure out the wavelength, okay? And we might remember, does anybody remember how we did that? It was a fairly simple computation. The wavelength. Did a little bit of 
division there, we can say something like, well, if we were traveling for one second, we'd go 343 meters. Now we have to do that 440 times in that one second, so I can do this. This is equal to the 343 meters per second divided by my neighbor to the left, this guy. And this gives me actually the length of the wave in meters, okay? So this is wavelength in meters. Okay? That's 0.77 meters long. So we can think about having compressed air, rarefied air, happening over a certain region of space. And it's actually a little bit less than one meter for what we have for the tone that we just listened to. Right? We have a 0.77 meter wavelength. We can convert that, if it helps, to centimeters just by multiplying by 100. So we can say that the wave is 77 centimeters long, interestingly. Does anybody remember the conversion factor to get from centimeters to inches? 2.54, okay, let's put in inches here, right, okay. So we can take that and divide by this. Okay, so we'll take that and we'll divide by 2.54. Okay, so that tone that I just played you is now a bunch of compressed air and rarefied air, and the compressions and rarefactions are happening over this 30 second range, or 30 second uh, region of space. Okay, that's what we've got going on. Now we can just copy all this down and go back to the question that got us started on this whole long game. We can say, well, what's going on if we have a different frequency? The one that gave us that nice quadratic shape was 6,000 hertz, right? So let's put in a 6,000 here. The speed of sound remains the same, okay? And how big is that wave? That wave is now only two inches long. Okay? So we went up in frequency, which means we come down in wave. Yeah, people okay with that? Okay. And we'll do one other one. What was the other frequency in that question on IIDs? Does anybody recall? We asked about a 6,000 hertz tone, and what was the other one? 200. Let's put that in. We'll just plop it in, and all the relations remain the same. We're now about 67 uh, inches long. Okay. So I have this going on here. Um, I, myself, as it turns out, uh, I am almost exactly 5 foot 7, which is 67 inches. So that diagram that you had a moment ago that had the 200 hertz tone, if you wanted to know how long in space is the 200 hertz tone, it's about as long as I am tall. You know, if you lay me down on the floor, that's the range of space over which that 200 hertz tone is operating. And we'll hear that by going over here, put in 200. Okay? So that's my length. Okay, if we double it, double this, that means we cut the length in half. That's half my length. Okay. And let's see if we can get this going. We'll stop that and we'll put in the 6,000 hertz tone. Okay, all right, so the idea there is that that thing is just this big, we've got about two inches lined up there. Yeah? Okay. So, as Zach was saying, this thing is coming into this ear and it tries to wrap around my relatively fat head and it doesn't make it to the other side. Okay? So we have something like a, a sound shadow. This thing doesn't wrap around. But if we have a 200 hertz tone, it's going to be longer than this thing is, that will easily wrap around to my other ear and there won't be any reduction in intensity. Who's all right with all of that? Okay? So we get some frequency dependence in this graph that somebody nicely drew. I don't know which one of you that was, but that's spot on. That's exactly what we want to see here. Okay? All right. So that was one of the two major cues for localizing inside of the azimuth. We have this interaural intensity difference. Okay? We have about four minutes left. Why don't we spend some time understanding the other major cue for azimuth? Okay? Uh, and this is the ITD. So can somebody help us out in understanding that? It'll be question seven. ITD. Okay, why don't we go with Sabelle and then with Sara. It's a disparity between the time of arrival and the last Okay, a time of arrival difference. Anything to add to that? Maybe she got it wrong. Okay, right. Yes, okay, so that, that's certainly going to be happening. We had another name for it. We called it an interval of time difference. Can we yell out what was the other name that it went by? Phase, phase difference. Okay, I think you got it. So, uh, Sarah's got it. Okay, it's an interval of phase difference. And when we talk about phase, we're talking about relative position in time or in space. Okay, okay. Um, so we have those, those time differences. Why don't we see if somebody else maybe has drawn, uh, why don't I just go to is that question eight? Okay, we'll see if somebody drew that one for us. Okay, and here we now have a graph of the interaural time differences. And I love this. Somebody put milliseconds, and look what number they gave us. Okay, why is that cool? <laughs> Not just that they gave us numbers, but they gave us those numbers. What's cool? Okay, go ahead, Gammy. 
it's a fraction of a millisecond. And I'll say that again. It's not just a fraction of a second. It's a fraction of a millisecond. Okay? So our nervous system, and certainly the bat nervous system, is able to pick up on these time of arrival differences between the two ears that are on a period of time less than one millisecond. Right? That's pretty cool. And that's it's really that's really pretty cool. Okay? And, and of course, at some point, if it's um, straight ahead of us, then the sound is going to arrive at the two ears at the same time. There will be a zero interoral time difference. If it's directly behind us, it's going to arrive at the two ears at the same time. That'll be a zero. But if it's off to this side or off to that side, we are going to have some kind of interoral time difference that will depend on a couple of factors. It will not depend on frequency, but it will depend on how large the head is. And this is different for different species. Within a species, we have young babies who have smaller heads. We have adults that have adult size heads. And so this is going to be changed throughout our life, but we have this nice cue that's available to us, um, and we're really exploiting this time of arrival difference between the two years. People okay with that? No. Okay. We have just a moment, and I'll set the stage for an upcoming question that we'll have, but I wanted to make sure I got the chance to play this. Um, so let me see if I can play you two tones first. I'll go over here. Here's my online tone generator. I'll go back to something like the tenor is trying to sing this note. Okay? And that, you might notice, is put on sine wave. Just stay with me on this one. I mean, that's put on sine wave. I'm going to play exactly the same note, but I'm going to put it on square wave. Okay? And some people are wincing. <laughs> okay? All right? Who remembers that we talked about Envision? sine waves and square waves before. Is that, is that all cool? All right, yeah? Does anybody remember how we built up a square wave from sine waves? We had a pattern to build that up using Fourier analysis. How did that, how did that go? Sabelle's sort of counting it out. Yeah, so we take all the, all the odd integers and we, we get all the odd integer multiples of a given sine wave. So let's end with this, I think, beautiful diagram can find that. Here we go. Okay, and I'll, I'll zip this up. So over here, way up top, we have a simple sine wave. Okay, this thing is going around and around. And we had seen that in one of our slides from, I think, the, day, the, le the lesson before the last lesson. You see the sine wave. And then we add, on top of that, a smaller sine wave or a smaller circle. And now when you have two components, you get a slightly more complicated function. If you add another component, notice we're going three, five, seven. Look how complicated the pattern gets, and we're starting to evince a square wave, whereas up here we have just a sine wave. So if we have more and more and more odd-numbered harmonic components, we can go from that very smooth tone that the tenor was singing to that game show buzzer kind of sound that we just heard a moment ago. Okay? Interesting just how elegant that is, and that Fourier could pick that out, and that our nervous systems are doing something like this in space for vision and in sound for, for hearing. Okay? All right. We're at 120. I'd like to start on time and end on time. I look forward to seeing your responses for Friday's classes on Heather Artinian and also on your review questions. It's all part of TED Ed. See you then. And I'll see some of you in just a few minutes next door.